Hi, everybody, and welcome to Three Seconds Ahead. I'm Andrew Johnson, and I get the opportunity to speak to uh, ordinary people who have extraordinary stories, uh, stories that we can, can all learn from. And those stories get to remind me of the journey that I've gone through in my life, and hopefully it allows my guests to remind themselves of the wisdom that they've picked up over, over time. Um, all pretty important right now, considering the circumstances we find ourselves in, where essentially we all in some way or another are having to begin again. And uh, when we begin again, um, sort of falling back on the basics, fundamentals is always the best place to begin or start again. Um, but we've all gone so far down the rabbit hole that we kind of forget what those are sometimes. So that's what my mission is, is to, to remind myself of the basics and, and the fundamentals and for my guests to remind themselves and hopefully you can learn something too. My guest today is Jean-Dre Joubert, who's a, a very dear friend of mine. Um, I have the privilege of rolling, rolling with him on the jiu-jitsu mat. So he's a fellow student and he's a teacher because he coaches as well. And I must say, from my experience, he's an outstanding teacher. He has an uncanny ability to, to get to the nub of things and also share them in a, in a way that's approachable and relaxing. So that's how I know him. Um, and the rest, I must say, is a bit of a mystery to me, um, how he came to be on the mat. And that's what, kind of what I'd like to focus on. But before we get to that, John Ray, you know, where does, yeah. uh, where does your, um, your story begin? Well, I mean, that's... I can give you the medium version and the very, very long version. You can um, begin wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we can start with my early childhood because I always like to trace back where my obsession with, with not just jujitsu but martial arts started yes. and fighting in general. So, I mean, um, the first few years of my life was, was quite turbulent with my parents. We don't have to get into the, the nitty gritty of that, but we moved around a lot. We weren't living the best lifestyle. Um, and then early teens, my parents got divorced and both of them remarried, but, um, my mom married my stepfather and he is currently a retired police officer, mm -hmm. but he was a police officer during the apartheid era. He also worked, um, with the special task force on, you know, cases of serial killers. Um, mm -hmm. so he was, still is quite, quite a cowboy, quite an intense individual. Yeah. And, um, I think he, he kind of introduced me and my brother to the, the physical side of things in terms of, so obviously growing up Afrikaans, rugby is a big thing, it's a mm -hmm. big cultural thing. You have to play rugby, you have to be physical. Um, I did in primary school, but I hated it. I don't know why. I always tease my family. <laughs> I'm like, let me, let me get this straight, right? We've got 30 grown men in shorts on a field chasing one ball, and then they all get all upset with me and, and, and yeah. whatnot. <laughs> so, uh, and my stepfather was quite open-minded in terms of not forcing us to do anything, but there was a rule. You're going to do something. You're going to do something physical. So the one day he literally dropped me off at a boxing gym. My <laughs> brother went to the kickboxing gym and uh, that's how I kind of started. And I, I, I fell in love with boxing, but something was missing for me with it. I mm -hmm. don't know what it was. Um, and also it was, was rough. Like my stepfather loved the, the idea that I was block boxing. My mom didn't. She was like, we're sending you to school to, to become smarter. And then in your spare time, you're damaging your brain. So it's a bit counterproductive. <laughs> sure that's not the first time a mother said that. <laughs> <laughs> so she wasn't crazy about the boxing and the kickboxing with, with me and my brother. But we did it. And, um, but it wasn't enough. And then strangely enough, after my stepfather obviously retired, you know, the, the security sector in our country is actually very small. Everybody knows everybody. So most of the people at ADT know, know the police because at some stage, some of the, the founders were, were working and they were, were all police officers at, at one stage. So he had a bunch of connections. He moved into security after the police, leaving the police force. And then um, he also did a little bit of bodyguard. And if I remember correctly, he, he was a bodyguard at one stage for two gigs for, I think, the CEO of South Sea. But I could be mistaken, so don't hold, mm. yeah. hold me to that. But for that high-profile client, they had to train with um, a VIP protection unit. And he was exposed. And this is, we're talking about maybe early 2000s, before it was even popular, um, that, that uh, Israeli martial arts, Krav Maga. Yes. 
and he was quite impressed with this Israeli guy that came and, and, and taught them like hand as arms and interpersonal violence. So then he said, if you find something similar to that, maybe that'll help you because I, I got a little bit bored with the boxing, mm -hmm. right? And there was a high emphasis in the gym at that time to, to really become competitive. Like you had to yeah. give everything up in time to do boxing. So then me and my brother, we actually found a Krav Maga place in the West Rand. It wasn't great. Um, I wasn't too impressed with it. It was a bit uh, unrealistic. But then I met a guy called Des Brown in the East Rand through that circle. And he teaches Krav Maga. And he yeah. was associated with Fight Fit Militia at that time. He was training yes. with the Chiquan yeah. and so that was, that was quite cool. And I met Dez and Dez had a very good stand-up background. So I started training in Krav Maga briefly. And then I started, again, just falling around, mixing around. There, there, wasn't, there was something missing for me, right? So then I, I entered the world of MMA. And I mean, 10 years ago, it was super difficult to find any place to train MMA. Never mind in the West Rand. Like in the West Rand, even to today, I think there's one or two gyms. So I went to this, this very popular MMA gym in the West Rand in Little Falls, the Fight Right MMA gym. I met Zuneid there years ago. Yes, he was oh, yeah. actually training there. Um, a great gym. And the one day after the training session, we're in the locker room. And um, you know how it is after training. We're all yes. sweaty. We'll all talk. And the one guy was talking. They were talking about places, um, basically where social spots, bars, etc. And the one guy said, you know, I haven't been to the doors in ages, right? The doors, and, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then the one, the other guy, there was another guy standing there and he was like, dude, the last time I was at the doors, me and my friend were stirring a bit of trouble. And then Rodney King and his bouncers came onto the dance floor and they, they basically kicked the crap out of him. And uh, when this guy spoke of Rodney King, like mm -hmm. the room became a little bit silent. And then no. everybody started looking. I lean over to the one guy. I'm like, who's this Rodney King guy? He's like, don't you know who Rodney King is? He's like the guy who started it all. He started in the main and everybody was also down. I was like, oh, wow. Like, so where does he train? Because I thought, well, I'd love to, to train with this guy. It's like, mm -hmm. no, Rodney doesn't teach anymore. He only does international. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was probably a year after that, I was watching EFC with my brother the one day, and we were, were fighting this new up and watching this new up and coming guy called Costa Ayanu. Yes, yes. Everybody was talking about Costa, like he was the, the up and coming guy. He, he's very well known in the Greek community. They even have this huge following, the Greek army that follows him. And I remember we were watching the fight where, we, where he was going to fight against um, Brendan Katz. And as he walked out, um, the commentator said something along the lines of, you know, Costa, he's the, the, the prodigy of Rodney King. It's a, and then that name hit me yeah. again. I was like, Rodney King. It's the second time I've heard that name. Yes. So then we watched the fight, tremendous fight. Little did I know that I would meet Costa and even meet Brendan Katz. He was part of the, the Monkey yeah. Jits uh, trainers program at one point as well. I remember the white belt loading with him. Um, but I never ever yeah. anticipated that I would meet them one day, yes, right? Yeah. So I'm watching the fight and Costa won and he did very well and Brendan as well. And then time went on and I was still kind of just floating around. Like every three months I would go to another gym and try and mm. train. You know, Julia and my brother went to train and fight with Pit Militia for a mm. while. And sorry, I know we're, we're constrained. No, no, time. no, please. I, I, this, this is a, I'm, go. I'm <laughs> loving this. And then what was uh, really, really interesting. So I don't know if you remember Divan. He yes, came I by do. our gym I about do. two years ago. Yes, yeah. Okay, so that's a very funny story about Divan. Divan and I went to school together, but when we were in, in school, we didn't really know each other. We mm. only became friends later on after school because his wife and my girlfriend are, are very close, the best friends, right? So we knew each other back then, but we weren't friends. Now, Divan was your typical round of the mill geek. Like, he hated mm. sports. He wasn't a physical guy at all. Um, very unassuming, very polite, like the last person that you would expect would ever be able to beat you in anything physical. Yeah, right? yeah. And he would say that himself. He, yeah. He'll laugh if he <laughs> right? And then we became friends after school, on and off, on and off. And then he got a job opportunity to move to Cape Town. So he mm. moved to Cape Town. Sorry, I'm terrible with years and time frames. Doesn't matter. So doesn't matter. But he moved to Cape Town, but he had to leave everybody behind, including his fiance at that time, Nicole. She couldn't go with him. 
So when he, he got to Cape Town, he started working there, he got a little bit depressed because he felt guilty. He didn't want to move on. And we all know it's very difficult to make friends in Cape Town if you don't know anybody there. So yes, he was alone. Yeah. So he tried a few things and then he stumbled across the Gracie um, Jiu Jitsu Academy in Pay Per View with, with James Clark. And he basically got obsessed with Jiu Jitsu. Which so you do. He went, he was, <laughs> yes, which you do. He got super impressed by it. And then basically what he did was he would train five, six, seven days a week. He would do the morning classes, do the evening classes because he had no social life. He didn't know anybody there. So he just got obsessed with Jiu Jitsu. And I remember that year, the December, he came back um, to Joburg to come and visit. And we were at a braai. And he came to me, he's like, you know, Donna, you've done a little bit of MMA, right? What do you think of jiu-jitsu? I'm like, oh, I've, I've done a little bit of wrestling. Um, but also a key frustration, I just have to point this out because this is why jiu-jitsu is so important to me now, is back then, when you would go into an MMA class, mm. um, they, they wouldn't really teach you jiu-jitsu. It mm. was very sporadic. Like you would go in and they'd teach you how to like do a round kick. Yeah. And then they'd make you spar. And then they'd be like, okay, so today we're going to do something called an arm bar. Like, mm. they, you, they don't even tell you what the position is. And then at the end, you're supposed to, like, grapple with people. And mm. then sometimes they would put strikes in because so, it's an MMA class. So the yes, guy would, like, yeah. sit on your chest and start punching you. Yeah. So it was very rudimental. Like, nobody yeah. really structured it in a, in a yeah. good way. And that frustrated me a lot. So then eventually that happened. So I told him, look, I've done a little bit of jiu-jitsu, mm. but not, not enough. Yeah. He's like, well, I've only been doing it for six mm. months. You know, would, do you want to grapple? Do you want to roll? And I was like, yeah, man, let's do it, right? And I'll admit this, right? At that time, and we were young guns, right? A little mm -hmm. bit of testosterone. I went in the back of my mind. I've been like, dude, I've sparred guys. I've rolled this guy. Like, I've got to win. And it's, and it's divine, right? Yes. So he's been doing it for six months, but he's not like a very physical yes. guy. And he literally steamrolled me. Like with yeah. six months of training, he yeah. wrecked me. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like very competitive or malicious. Mm. We were just rolling around on the ground having fun. But I could not believe that in six months, this guy like physically yeah. died. Yeah. Right? So then he said, listen, then, then you have to try and do jiu-jitsu. And I'm like, I don't know where. Like, yeah. I can't find a place to do it. Mm. Anyway, we discussed it. And I, I kept on searching for it. Kept on searching for it. And in the background, I kept on doing kickboxing and boxing and stand-up. and. Mm. And um, through the Krav Maga circle, mm. I, I was introduced to a gentleman called Ryan Davies quite a few years ago. Now, he trains in, in Rosebank. He owns the, uh, the, the primal gym in Rosebank, also a very um, famous gym. Mm. So um, he brought out a guy called Itai Gil from Israel to do a Krav Maga seminar. Now, out of all the Krav Maga guys, and whatever your opinion is, like Itai yeah. Gil is one of the, the very real legit mm. guys. So I was like, okay, we can't miss that. So I went to the seminar, had a great time, spoke to Ryan a bit, and he said that, you know, he, he went to, to Cape Town at one point, trying to do his technical blue belt and great mm -hmm. teacher to James Smart. But then James Smart told him, why don't you just train with Rodney King? I mean, Rodney King is like, so now this is the third time yes, that this yeah. name has popped up, right? So it's been, a, I mean, it was a hell of a journey to get to Rodney. Eh? Hell of a journey, hell of a journey. And I'm like, okay, so... But I heard Rodney King doesn't teach. And Ryan Davies was like, yeah, he doesn't, but he actually lives down my road. So I'm going to just go to this guy's house and ask him. Right? And yeah. apparently he went to Rodney and asked him, will you train me? And Rodney said, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I kept in touch with Ryan. I kept training, yeah. floating around. And then one day, Ryan phones me. He's like, you're still interested in doing jiu-jitsu? I'm like, absolutely. He's like, well, Rodney King's going to start doing Saturday classes at my gym. I was like, Jeez. listen, and, and how many years ago was that? That was probably six, six, seven years ago. I don't know. I, I stand corrected. I'm bad with time. So, um, so um, I mean, I said to interrupt you there for a second because that's a hell of a yeah. story. I mean, the at, the at the end of the day, it's actually quite familiar. I mean, my journey was was over a longer period, but was very short in that. I mean, you said that you tried a whole lot of different things. You'd been exposed to a lifestyle and a family environment and a culture of physical aggression and strength through rugby, yeah. which you didn't enjoy, yeah. no. but you played it because everybody did. <laughs> and then yeah. your, your stepdad, and it sounds to me that, I mean, he's quite a tough guy, but you, in, in many ways, you're quite grateful to him for that because it put you on yeah. this path. Um, 
And then from there, you started experimenting with different things and ended up with Rodney King, who is my first coach. I mean, I, I mean, our age difference is quite, quite big, but my journey was similar is that I was exposed to Kung Fu sort of five, six, seven years ago, which I love, but it just was missing something. As you said, there was just something missing. And then I tried hmm. Krav Maga for a week. And then I tried, uh, what's the Korean one with lots of kicking? I forget now. I tried that for two weeks yeah. and it just didn't sit with me. And then I saw the sign for Sugarfoot uh, Rodney's gym and you just, you, like being on the mats and doing that, it, it works for me. And, and that's the thing is, is now you found Rodney, you start working on Saturdays uh, or training on Saturdays. I mean, what, what is it that kept you with Jits? What do you love about it? Love about jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Okay, well, this is, this is phenomenal for me. <laughs> the first thing is, is with boxing, I love boxing. I love box, uh, doing it still. I love striking. I go through cycles where one week striking is my favorite and the next yeah. one is jiu-jitsu. But the key thing is, there's a certain temperament and a certain level of toughness that you unfortunately need. And I had to experience that as a teenager, right? Going yeah. into a yeah. boxing gym, yeah. getting my head bashed in right and usually in the beginning you're, you're unimportant as well so you just kind of meet all the fresh guys because they're training some golden gloves champion or some springbok yes, champion yeah. so you just kind of yeah. fed in there and if you stick around long enough it's good enough and what i and look jujitsu used to be that way as well mm. right but i think what's changed and especially with the philosophy around it now is that people like like divan and i don't mean that in an insulting way but somebody who isn't necessarily physical um, who never thinks that they'll be able to do it, you can actually introduce them to a functional martial art that will keep you engaged, that will take mm. years of live practice and problem solving to, to get good at without them taking unnecessary damage or traumatizing them. And through yeah. that process, you can actually toughen them up. So being tough isn't, isn't a requirement that you need beforehand. It's mm. actually something that you can you know acquire through it and then obviously yeah. my obsession with it is just obviously how effective it is how mm -hmm. fun it is how deep it yes. goes how individual it is and universal across across the board so jujitsu is it's the real deal i think that's maybe it without having to get your nose broken the same way that yeah. you would if you had to do boxing or kickboxing unfortunately yeah and i mean what i like um is that what, what what sort of drew me to it is was the the reality of it is the fact that yeah. I mean and and it's what we suffering through at the moment and I choose that word carefully suffering because um, we can't practice jujitsu effectively at the moment because we can't roll with somebody else and that that physical connection that you that you build up with people with that absolute level of trust because you literally Absolutely. can kill somebody and break their arm like mm. pop the shoulder out and that kind of thing. And you really have to surrender yourself to the other person um, and really, really trust them. And mm. I mean, I know that coming to the game, for me, I gave myself three goals when I was uh, 45, when I turned 45. One of them was to learn how to defend myself. And I've said this in the change room before. The irony mm. for me was, is yes, I'm learning how to defend myself. But step one, I had to discover myself. And mm. jiu-jitsu gave me the opportunity to really dig deep and discover what's important to me and why it's important to me. And, and these sort of belief systems that I have, like I, I believed strongly that forcing my way through life was the only way, like using strength as we say on the mats. I mean, that just gets me into trouble every single time. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I've had to unlearn that. And the concept mm. of space is that no matter how close somebody is to you, there's always some space. There's always an opportunity to, to and if there's space, there's solution. Because all yeah. you are is that I'm in, I find myself in a problem that's, that where the solution is looking for it. Because the solution's there. You just have to allow it in. And that, yeah. for, for me, JITS is just unbelievable. But, I mean, that's about me. And, I, I mean, it's just fascinating, the, the parallels and our journeys at different times in our lives, how you got there. But, I mean, that's what's really important is that then you decided to start teaching it. I mean, you're mm. a teacher now. And, sadly, the gym is uh, on pause, let's call it, because I'm, I'm, I'm a big supporter. Um, mm. So, so how, now you're becoming a coach. Why? Yeah. What does it give you? So, I mean, in the beginning, 
it was because I, I've spent so much time and it was just pure passion. And I would yeah. say, I think in the beginning, it was about me, right? It was about, yeah. okay, I enjoy doing this. But I think with, with time, I very quickly started to realize that it's not about me. Mm. It's about other people. And I think that's just a part of my personality probably, but I enjoy working with people. Yes. Um, but and you're also, good at it. As, as obsessed as I am with jiu-jitsu, I'm just as obsessed with how to actually learn it and how people learn it. Yeah. Like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuine interest for me. It's like, what's the best way to teach somebody to think, right? Yes. Whether it's, and that transcends everything, whether it's martial arts, stand-up, whatever your profession is, and, and mm. how do you go about mastering? I think that obsession guides me in terms of not just doing jujitsu for my own personal, because there's obviously always still my own personal game and things that I work on, but then also understanding on a deeper level, how do you, how does one person transfer that information to the other person? How do you help each other grow and see, see that happen? And that, that gives me a lot of joy. Um, when I started teaching kids, it was phenomenal. I, I never ever thought I would enjoy yeah. it as much as I do. Right? Yeah. Just seeing those kids look, you have to be on your A game, right? If you think it's difficult to have a bunch of grown men not kill each other, right? Yeah. Try having a bunch of kids, right? <laughs> just, <laughs> and just arms and elbows and parents. And, but it's so much fun. And one thing I've enjoyed, I think, about the learning process is exactly that jujitsu, and I see it in the adults, it's like you return to that childlike state yeah, yeah. where you get to, you're a grown man, right? But you get on that mat and you're like a child again. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> like I know. In there, rolling around, trying to problem solve. You, you're experiencing all of these different emotions. Some days are up, some days are down. Sometimes mm. you're frustrated. But it's fun and it's engaging. And it engage, engages you both on a cerebral and a physical level. So, so that, yeah. that's my obsession. But also, I, I genuinely just enjoy working with people yeah. and so, seeing them grow. And also, that, that feeling that you get where... Six months down the line, you look back and you can't you can't recognize yeah. yourself. Well, well, just I, six months. I, don't. I mean, what what I've heard you say is okay. There's a couple of things that are really powerful. Is is that I mean, you're passionate about it. You absolutely love it. Yeah. You love the idea of solving the problems for yourself, but then you've also realized that helping or assisting other people to solve problems for themselves is massively rewarding. And yeah. And and the whole journey of learning to teach. Um, because it's, it's difficult. I mean, I've said this a few times. I want to teach my sons and, and I've, I'm trying to get my head around it. I'll get there. But, um, mm. So that's really, really powerful. But you've, you've mentioned a, a word um, quite a lot, which is problem solving or a phrase, problem solving. And what's interesting, yeah. and it popped into my head the other day, is I mean, essentially, life is a series of problems. I mean, the moment you solve a problem, you just present it with a new problem. I mean, whether you solve a problem or not, you still have a problem. Because yeah, still, either you still got to solve it, either you got to solve it, or you got the next one to solve. And yeah. what what Jits and, and you've touched on something really powerful is what Jits has done for me. And I mean, remember, I'm close to fifty, so for young people to realize this is amazing, is that all it is is a is a problem. Just relax. Don't forget to mm -hmm. breathe. Remember that thing when you first start as a white belt. Hey, stop, please don't forget to breathe. Okay, um, don't panic. It's just a problem. That's all it is. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're going to create the solution. It's there. It exists already. But mm. you know, do not in, don't be in such a rush. It'll come to you. And if you trust yeah. everybody around you, you trust your teacher and the teacher trusts themselves, it'll be an amazing, phenomenal journey. I mean, that's what I heard you say. I don't, it, it, is that what Absolutely. you said? Yeah. Absolutely. The, the problem with jujitsu is the problem that you've solved has now gotten better because it's starting to solve you as well, your partner. So it's, it's, just, it's just like the problem is evolving as well. So yes. you, you solve it and then it adapts and it comes back. Right? Yeah, it's like a virus. So better, <laughs> yeah. So the better you get at solving it, the better it gets at solving you. Yeah. So it's like a continuous loop of improvement, which is yeah. phenomenal. And one thing I, I think that's also incredible, and you've experienced this, in, especially in our gym, but I think it's jujitsu culture as well. Uh, uh, overall is the sense of camaraderie mm. that you have where you know literally 
just after you get off, off the mat, you are best friends because you both have experienced this thing and it was true, it was real, it was unscripted, mm. it was messy, it was chaotic, but you were both part of that experience and now you can be friends. And maybe, you know, 10 minutes ago, you were literally trying to strangle that person. You know, <laughs> take their arm. Yes, but somehow yeah. that like deepens the bond, right? Yeah. And it's, it, it really is fascinating. And it's something that I've tried to carry over into my and up classes as well yeah. and i have to say it, it it has translated but it also works because a lot of people that do the stand-up with me have started to do jiu-jitsu as well so there's an overall camaraderie where where we're trying to build each other up instead mm. of breaking down but it, it it is incredible but yeah problem I mean, solving the, is a big thing yeah the concept and the thing is is and it's what's just just hit me now is tapping out is also solving the problem yeah it's absolutely. not losing i'm just solving the problem Okay, cool. Yeah, Tap out. Exactly. Let's start again. Like, I haven't lost and you haven't won. I've solved the exactly. problem over you. Let's move on. So, it, you, like, you stop fighting each other and fighting. And if you use your partner as a reflection of yourself, you just stop fighting yourself. Um, yeah. Easier said than done. Um, but it does give you the opportunity to reflect on yourself. Now, now Jandre, uh, that's been a fantastic journey down to jiu-jitsu and, and understanding um, the extraordinary life that you've had up to date. I mean, and there's one area and I just explored not too much detail is that you suffered from a physical injury. I think it was two or three years ago. Yeah. Um, that really set you back. And certainly from an observer's perspective, I had great admiration for your, your patience and your, and your fortitude during that particular time. Um, and I think just the last few minutes, I'd like you like to reflect on that if you're comfortable doing so. Just oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the gist of it, again, we can have another discussion one day about yeah. the whole way that I ended up in hospital, but it, it was basically a complete kind of freak accident um, and also emergency surgery. They thought my appendix um, burst. And then they thought it didn't. And then they went through a bunch of x-rays and all of this happened in a span of a few hours. And the next thing I knew, I, I was heading into emergency surgery. They were supposed to make a small incision just to see what was going on with my appendix. Then when I woke up from the surgery, they basically cut open my entire abdomen. So they went from the sternum all the way down to the belly button. So I had a, a vertical incision um, because they had to open up my entire abdomen to see mm. what this fluid and the presence on on my abdomen was which they then eventually drained um to this day we don't know how the fluid got there if it was genetic if, if it's some type of a disease and my, my blood test came back positive it's, it's a little bit of a mystery because mm, there yes. was nothing wrong with my appendix or any of my organs but the point was that i had full abdominal surgery and also not just a small incision literally my entire stomach mm. cut open so i couldn't walk for a while and then once i started walking i had to take it very easy and the, the first physiotherapist I saw said, you're, you're probably not going to do jiu-jitsu again. It's yeah. not going to happen. Like, it's, it's somebody who's a little bit bigger than you, who's got a weight advantage, puts their knee down on you, on your stomach, it's, it's the end. And one thing that happened during that whole time is that I had to accept what is in my control. And it, it sounds so simple. A lot mm. of people, you know... When you say stuff like that, it's, it sounds very motivational, cheesy, whatever, but it's, it's true, right? Sometimes you're faced in a, in a situation where all you can do is focus on what is in your control. And I said to myself, jujitsu isn't in my control. None of that is in my control. But what is in my control is how good I recover from this and how well I recover from this. And, and also the mental skill of actually turning it around. And the first thing I realized was that Jiu-jitsu is not going anywhere. As much mm. as you love it, whether it's three years from now, five years from now, you can go back to it. First thing I did. Yeah. Second thing I did was I, I really focused and put my focus on doing the proper recovery. So I, I did Pilates, I did stretch, I listened yeah, yeah. to the physio. And I didn't want to. I'll tell you that. I did not <laughs> want to. That right? sounds familiar. But I did. And then, so complete acceptance and then focusing on the things that were in my control which was resting and strangely enough through doing that i gained even more knowledge and perspective in terms of how to recover how good something like pilates and yoga because before that 
all I used to do was just jujitsu, just boxing, nothing mm. else, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to do that. And then I actually realized the value in actually taking care of your body, not just using your body, but actually taking care of it. Yeah. Like doing things that will heal it and that will preserve longevity. Um, so that same mindset, that patience that I had, I, I apply it now every single so, day. So what's interesting for me, like just that sort of um, thing is like the chicken or the egg. So the, the moment, what I'm hearing you say is, is that the patience was a result of a product of the acceptance of what yeah. you could control and what mm. you couldn't. And Absolutely. I mean, like that powerful realization of, well, jujitsu is not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah. It's not going in. And, and I know that wherever it's going, I will follow it. I'll catch up at some point. But in order to catch up with it, I need to focus on what I can do now, which is recover. Mm. So I will go and I will find those people that can help me recover as best as I possibly can. And I will listen to them. As much as I don't want to. So you opened up your mind, you opened your mind and you listened and then you practiced what they preached. Yeah. And as a result, Absolutely. I mean, and it's, and I, I, can, I can say this confidently because I now roll with you. I mean, you are stronger now. Uh, and when I say stronger, I don't mean physical strength. I mean, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally, you're stronger now than you were before that incident. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Every, everybody has told me that. Everybody has said, dude, it's, it's like you never even had the surgery. And I was, I, I, so I was out. So it's actually, yeah, it's almost been the anniversary for it because it, it happened the last week of April of that year. Mm. So um, I only got on the mat the next year in Jan. I, mm. I, 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 I will admit this, my ego got the best of me. And around September, I think it was about around the five month mark, I really, you know, got a little bit antsy and I was like, man, I, I can still go. And then I went on the mat and luckily I rolled with, with people that I could trust. But then I rolled with, I think it was with Ryan and we just did something and I felt my stomach. And when I felt my stomach, I went back and I think you were there. Mm -hmm. Ryan was there and I think Dalen was mm -hmm. there as well. And afterwards you all were like, listen, give it a break like still just wait a bit and i did yeah I it, it was it was in the it was in the change room i remember that yeah. day i do remember it and then and i then i gave myself another four months and i just yeah. diligently waited 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 and then I, I was able to come back to the mat and i never had the expectation that i was going to go back full swing i actually thought that maybe i'll be doing a little bit of jujitsu and then just kind of mm. kind of regain my cool. skill but then it just accelerated yeah, listen, I mean, we could talk for hours. I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you. We've got a, a little bit of time left. So I just want to wind it up um, by, before I ask you the last question, because we may have another mm. time, it's just thanking you very much for your time. And, and uh, Jean de, I know that, that I'm looking forward to getting back on the mat with you. And I'm sure everybody else who listens to this will, all seems this, feels the same way. We all on the journey together, um, mm. and as a as a crew, and I said it to Dalen, and he came up with the phase of it's the glue that gets you through, and the glue is the team. It's us. Absolutely. We have, we Absolutely. have the responsibility to be the crew. Uh, so thank you so much for your time, and if you've got something else, just a message to give out to everybody out there, um, is that anything that comes to mind? Um. I would say exactly that. And I, I think just, just to add that to martial arts, I think that's what martial arts also teaches you. It teaches you to focus on what is in your control. Yeah. I can't control when I grapple with somebody how big they are, how strong they are, what mm -hmm. their game is. The only thing that's actually in my control is how I respond. So I would say if you want to really, really, you know, whether it's with the COVID-19, with business problems, personal problems, focus on the part that you can control. Yeah. That, that's really the most effective thing. Yeah. It's as as we said. It's just a problem that's yes. looking that's looking for a solution. Absolutely. Fine. Listen, John Ray. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you. And maybe we should have another chat chat in a month or two's time because I think there's Absolutely. a lot more we can explore. Definitely. The views and opinions expressed by this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Three Seconds Ahead. Any content provided by our authors are of their opinion 
and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. While authors strive for accuracy, we can and will be wrong at times, as any honest person will have to admit.